Welcome to chapter 8, joints. Chapter 8 has been divided up into two parts. Uh, this is part 1. In part 1, we will classify joints uh, based on their structure as well as their degree of movement. From there, we will talk about synovial joints and their general structure. We will cover movements that occur at synovial joints, and then we will finish up with types of synovial joints. First off, what is a joint? Uh, you may also hear it referred to as an articulation, uh, but either way, uh, they will be a site where two or more bones come together. Um, and as previously mentioned, joints belong to the skeletal system, and they are what gives the skeleton its mobility, but they also bind these bones together. Um, certain joints that you may be familiar with where you can actually think of mobility would be the knee joint, or the shoulder joint. We will see that we are able to classify joints based on two things. Uh, the first and what we will primarily focus on in this lecture is the structure of the joint. Uh, when you're trying to classify a joint based on its structure, you want to consider what material is binding the joint together and is there a joint cavity. So we have three structural classifications, fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints, and synovial joints. The other way that we are able to classify joints is based on its function, or rather the degree of movement that that joint allows. Uh, we have synarthroses, which are immovable joints. You should think of sutures, or the joints binding the skull bones together. Amphiarthroses are slightly movable joints. And lastly, diarthroses are freely movable joints. The joints that we typically think about, like the hip or the elbow, are considered diarthrosis joints because they are highly mobile. From here on out, we will focus on joints based on their structure. Um, and if you recall, the three structural classifications of joints were fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. We'll start with fibrous, um, and as its name suggests, uh, the material that is binding a fibrous joint together will be fibrous connective tissue. Um, and then with each of these joints based on their structure, we also have to figure out, is there a joint cavity present? And in this case, there are not. Uh, and for the most part, fibrous joints are going to be synarthroses or immovable joints. We can further break down fibrous joints into three different types, sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. As previously mentioned in chapter seven, a suture is found in the skull. Um, a suture that is a joint is binding two or more skull bones together. And this is the last joint that we want to be moving uh, simply because our brain is encased in our skull. You could see here in picture A that this is taken from the frontal bone, the temporal bone, and the parietal bone. Again, these bones are bound together by fibrous connective tissue. Another type of fibrous joint is known as a syndesmosis. Uh, the best example of that will be the inferior tibiofibular joint. Oftentimes, the name of a joint will tell you what bones are coming together to create it. In this case, this joint is found at the distal or inferior end um, and it connects the tibia to the fibula, or the bones of the leg. The last type of fibrous joint is known as a gomphosis, um, and the one example of a gomphosis will be the teeth in their sockets. Um, remember the alveolar processes of the maxilla and the mandible. As the teeth sit in there, they are anchored by this periodontal ligament, um, but again, these peg in socket joints or the teeth are examples of a gomphosis. The next type of joint that is based on its structural classification is known as a cartilaginous joint. As you may have guessed, joints are uh, united or bound to each other by cartilage. Same as a fibrous joint, there is no cavity present. Um, and they are also not highly mobile. We have two different types or two examples of a cartilaginous joint. The first is a synchondrosis and the other is a symphysis. Uh, 
Again, that term chondro means cartilage. So as soon as you see the term synchondrosis, you should be thinking cartilaginous joint. The best example of a synchondrosis will be the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate that is found in long bones. Um, a synchondrosis will include a plate of hyaline cartilage that is binding bones together. In this case, the epiphyseal plate will bind the epiphysis to the diaphysis of a long bone. Another example would be the cartilage of the first rib as it unites with the manubrium or the superior portion of the sternum. Next, the symphyses. Uh, two best examples will be the intervertebral discs. We discussed those in chapter 7. Remember, the intervertebral disc includes the nucleus pulposus, or the jelly of the jelly donut. That jelly is surrounded by a ring of fibrocartilage known as the annulus fibrosus. Another example is the pubic symphysis, a thick pad of fibrocartilage found in between the left and right pubic bones. To reiterate synchondroses and symphysis, both examples of cartilaginous joints. In the top image, we see the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate in what appears to be the humerus. Um, on the right, you have the costal cartilage uh, that is uniting rib one to the manubrium. On the bottom, you are able to see a section of the vertebral column with a portion of it cut out to show you that intervertebral disc. And again, on the right, we have the pubic symphysis uniting the left and right pubic bones. And the last type of joint that can be classified based on its structure is known as a synovial joint. Um, and this is the joint type that we will focus on uh, for the remainder of this lecture, as well as for chapter eight, part two. Uh, in this case, this is the joint that will have a fluid-filled cavity. Um, synovial joints that you might be familiar with include the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, and the hip joint. Um, all of them are diarthrotic, which means they are freely movable. And again, as I just said, a synovial joint really includes all limb joints, or at least almost all limb joints. We'll spend the next couple of minutes looking at the general features uh, that synovial joints share with each other. Um, synovial joints will have bursa or tendon sheaths. Uh, we'll talk about stability and how it's affected across these joints. We will definitely get into movements that are allowed at synovial joints as well as the six different types of synovial joints. Starting with the six general features, uh, the first is that synovial joints will contain articular cartilage. Remember, articular cartilage is an example of hyaline cartilage. Uh, we name it articular rather than hyaline because we find it at the ends of long bones where we have joints or articulations. Next, as previously mentioned, synovial joints will have a synovial cavity. In this cavity, we find synovial fluid to reduce friction because these joints are freely movable. Lastly, uh, we will find joint capsules surrounding synovial joints. We have a capsule surrounding the shoulder joint, a capsule surrounding the elbow joint. Within this capsule, we have two layers, uh, the outer fibrous layer, which you should know from unit one, is comprised of dense, irregular connective tissue to allow for pull and tension in many different directions. The inner membrane is known as the synovial membrane. This is the layer that is responsible for producing synovial fluid to fill the joint cavity. Another characteristic or contribution to the structure of a synovial joint is the synovial fluid. As previously mentioned, it is produced by the synovial membrane that helps to create the joint capsule. But the purpose of this fluid, again, is to lubricate or reduce friction um, along the two moving bones. Within this fluid, we also find plasma, which is a part of blood. Uh, we find hyaluronic acid as well as phagocytic cells to engulf and digest certain microbes as well as debris. 
When we get into the knee and the shoulder joint, we will talk about different types of ligaments, and we will see ligaments like the ACL um, or even the PCL. These ligaments help to reinforce the joint and provide stability. Lastly, synovial joints will have nerves and blood vessels. You know where your body and your limbs are in space because of these nerves. They also help to detect pain as well as monitor your position in space and stretch. Lastly, synovial joints do contain blood vessels. They do require nutrition. Uh, we also need to get debris and waste out of the joint capsule, uh, but we have capillary beds within these joints to allow for exchange of nutrients and wastes. On this picture shown on the slide, you are able to point out some of the characteristics um, that belong to the general structure of a synovial joint. The first will be the articular cartilage. Again, articular is an example of hyaline cartilage. We call it articular cartilage because it covers the ends of long bones where we find articulations or joints. Other um, examples of the structure that we will see here is the joint cavity. Uh, so we do have a space. That space is filled with synovial fluid to reduce friction. And surrounding these bones where they articulate with one another, we find a capsule. And this capsule, again, is made up of a fibrous layer, which is dense, irregular connective tissue, and a deeper synovial membrane, which will produce and secrete synovial fluid to fill the cavity. In addition to the previously mentioned six characteristics, we also have some other features, um, such as fatty pads, and those are just going to be pads of fat there for extra cushioning. Um, in certain joints, we will find articular discs, also known as menisci. We have a medial and a lateral meniscus that belong to the knee joint. Those will be rings of fibrocartilage that are great for compression, but they all are also there to improve the fit of the bone ends and make sure they align up with each other perfectly. Lastly, we have bursa and tendon sheaths. These bursa and tendon sheaths will be um, basically bags of fluid where we would find friction or tension. In part two, when we visit the knee joint, we will see that the knee joint sometimes contains up to 12 bursa or more. Um, and if you have ever experienced bursitis, that will be an inflammation of one of these bursa. On this slide here, we are looking at a frontal section through the right shoulder joint. So anytime you see a picture, you always want to orient yourself. Uh, since we know this is the shoulder joint, uh, we will have the humerus or the bone of the arm. The head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity on the scapula. Seen superior to the shoulder joint, we find the acromion process of the scapula. But what you should point out from this image is uh, several bursa as well as a tendon sheath. If you look inferior to the acromion process, you find a bursa, known as the subacromial bursa, to reduce friction. We also see a tendon sheath here, which is going to wrap around the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle. Again, the purpose of tendon sheaths and bursa is to reduce friction in tight spaces where bones, muscles, um, or ligaments may rub against each other. For the next portion of this lecture, we are going to get into movements that are allowed at synovial joints. This portion of the lecture is going to be extremely important moving forward, especially in chapter 10 when we talk about muscles. Uh, we are going to cover many different types of movements, so it's extremely important that you learn them now uh, so you don't have to worry about them as much in the future. But prior to getting into the movements, we need to address several terms, such as origin and insertion. Muscles attached to bone. Uh, 
and usually a muscle will attach at two points, if not more. And we have names for those two points of attachment. The first attachment is usually more proximal, but it is known as the origin. The origin of a muscle is found on the immovable bone. The other attachment is known as the insertion. This is usually distal, and we find the insertion on the bone that moves during the action. An example that you could think about would be uh, doing a biceps curl. So the biceps brachii is going to originate on the scapula and insert onto the radius in the forearm. Now picture doing a bicep curl or simply move your forearm towards your arm. Your scapula is not moving. That's the origin or the immovable bone. The forearm is what is actually moving during muscle contraction. So that is the insertion in the forearm. A few more terms that you should be familiar with refer to the range of motion that is allowed at the synovial joints. Um, and it's really based on how many planes that joint is able to move through. The first is non-axial. If a synovial joint produces non-axial range of motion, it is simply slipping movements only. So flat bones that are sliding against each other. We will see this in the wrist and in the ankle. Uniaxial, so movement in one plane or around one axis. Biaxial, movement in two planes. Multiaxial, movement in or around all three planes. Again, these planes include the coronal or frontal plane, the sagittal plane, and the transverse or horizontal plane. From here, we will talk about three general types of movements, but get very specific with each of them. We have gliding movements, angular movements, and rotation. Let's talk about gliding movements. As previously mentioned, this type of movement usually occurs when flat bones slip or glide up against each other. Certain examples are provided here for you. Um, and the one that you see pictured is the intercarpal joints. Again, use the name of the joint to help you find where it is in the body. Intercarpal means that this joint is found in between the carpal bones. You will have intercarpal joints between the scaphoid and trapezium, between the capitate and the hamate, but either way, when those bones slide against each other, it produces a gliding movement. So think about waving your hand side to side. We also see gliding movements in the ankle that occur at the intertarsal joints. We know that the tarsal bones like the navicular and the cuboid are found in the ankle. We also see gliding movements occur uh, between the superior and inferior articular processes of vertebrae. So think about leaning forward or bending side to side. Next up is angular movements, and these will be mentioned frequently throughout the remainder of the course. Um, angular movements will result from an increase or a decrease in angle between moving bones. Um, angular movements are an example of a uniaxial movement. This movement occurs along one plane, and that is the sagittal plane. Certain movements will be flexion and extension. So going back to the biceps curl, when you, or even picking up a textbook, when you pick up that textbook from a table and bring it towards your chest, that is flexion. You are decreasing the angle between the arm and the forearm. Now think about taking that textbook from your chest and laying it back down on the table, that is extension. You are now increasing the angle between the arm and the forearm. Now might be a good time to practice flexion and moving on from flexion and extension um, into a different angular movement. We have a abduction and a deduction. Abduction, also known as abduction. Uh, will be taking away from the midline. So think of an alien abduction. You are taking away from something. 
So if your arms are down by your side, think about raising them up and out. This is along the frontal plane, whereas flexion and extension occurs along the sagittal plane. A deduction now, or adduction, think of adding to the body. So if your arms are out up in the air by your sides, think about dropping them back down to your side. You are now adding to the body. Next, we have circumduction. So think of a circle or making a cone shape in the air. Circumduction involves all of the following angular movements, flexion, abduction, extension, and adduction. Circumduction can be found uh, with the upper limb as well as with the lower limb. The last type of general movement allowed at a synovial joint is known as rotation. Uh, again, this is not circumduction, it's not flexion, extension, abduction, or adduction. Think about turning a bone around its long axis. So you could see this with the humerus in the arm as well as with the femur in the thigh. A simple example of rotation is shaking your head no or from side to side. When you shake your head no side to side, that is rotation occurring between the atlas, or C1, and the axis, C2. With your arm now, if you're holding your arms out at 90 degrees, think about rotating your humerus towards the midline, bringing your hands towards your body. That is medial rotation. Now, if your hands are out in front of you and your elbows are at 90 degrees, Take your hands away from the midline. Laterally rotate your arm. In addition to those three movements, gliding, angular, and rotation, we also have special movements that occur at really one or two joint in particular. The first group of special movements that we have will be supination and pronation. This occurs at the radius and ulna when the radius rotates about the ulna. Supination is palms up, so think about holding your arms out in front of you with your palms up. I like to think more soup, please. As you rotate the bones in your forearm to produce your palms facing the floor now, that is pronation. Another special movement that occurs at the ankle joint now is dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Think about driving a car. As you take your foot off of the brake, or as you lift your foot and toes up off of the ground, that is dorsiflexion. As you go into maybe a calf raise, or you're going up on your toes, that is plantar flexion. Again, supination and pronation only occur in the forearm, and dorsiflexion and plantar flexion only occur at the ankle joint. The next group of special movements that we have will be inversion and eversion. Inversion, you are bringing the plantar surface or the bottom of your foot towards the midline. So think about rolling your ankle. Eversion is the opposite. Eversion is taking the plantar surface or the bottom of your foot and turning it out laterally or towards the side. Protraction and retraction will occur at the mandible or the lower jaw as well as the scapula or your shoulder blades. Protraction, think about moving it forward. As you can see here, the girl in the picture is jutting her jaw out forward to protract it. And when she brings it back, she retracts it. With the scapula now, you want to think about where it is moving in relation to the vertebral column. When you protract your scapula, think about throwing a punch or pushing your arm out in front of you to protect yourself. As you move the scapula away from the vertebral column, that is protraction. Retraction now, if you think about doing a row or squeezing your shoulder blades together as if you had a quarter in between them. That is scapular retraction.
continuing on with these special movements, we also have elevation and depression, which also occur at the mandible and scapula. Elevating your mandible would be closing your mouth or bringing your mandible up towards your maxilla. Depression would be dropping your mandible. When we talk about elevation and depression of the scapula, think about bringing your shoulders up towards your ears as if you were shrugging them. That is scapular elevation. Now think about pushing your shoulders towards the floor or away from your ears. That is depression. As humans, we have opposable thumbs. So if you take your thumb and you touch the tip of your thumb to the other four fingers, that is opposition. In the last portion of this lecture, we will talk about the six different types of synovial joints, as well as provide examples for each. Um, so you should know this for your exam, again, the six types, as well as examples. There are plane joints, hinge, pivot, condylar, saddle, ball and socket. The first type of synovial joint is a plane joint. So again, think about that gliding or sliding movement, movement in one plane. Uh, so examples will be intercarpal joints, intertarsal joints, and the joints formed at the vertebral articular processes. Again, intercarpal is between the carpal bones in the wrist, which are pictured here. Intertarsal joints occur between the tarsal bones in the ankle. Hinge joint. Uh, the best example of a hinge joint will be the elbow joint, which allows for flexion and extension. We also have the interphalangeal joints, which occur between the phalanges in the fingers. A pivot joint. A pivot joint allows for rotation. Uh, great examples will be the joint between C1 and C2, also known as the atlantoaxial joint. Another example is the proximal radio ulnar joint. This joint is close to the elbow, but this is the joint that allows for supination and pronation in the forearm, or rotation of the radius about the ulna. A condylar joint allows for biaxial movement or movement in two planes. Um, examples include the metacarpophalangeal joints, which are the joints between your metacarpals in the palm and the phalanges or the proximal phalanges. These are your knuckles. You are able to flex, extend, but you're also able to abduct and adduct. Your wrist joint is also an example of a condylar joint. Try to mimic these motions on your own. There's one saddle joint in the human body. It is found at the thumb, uh, and it occurs between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. Make sure you know which carpal bone helps to form the saddle joint of the thumb. And the last type of synovial joint and the most mobile is known as a ball and socket joint. Two examples in the human body, you have the shoulder joint, which is also known as the glenohumeral joint. It is the articulation between the glenoid cavity on the scapula and the head of the humerus, which is pictured here. You have a nice ball-shaped part of the bone, which fits nicely into the socket or to the cup. We also have the hip joint. We know that the hip joint is definitely more stable than the shoulder joint, but also less mobile. Again, in this lecture, chapter 8, part 1, we covered joint classifications, the synovial joint structure, movements that occur at synovial joints, and the six types of synovial joints.